I apologize at the beginning for two reasons. The one reason is that I am sitting, but uh, uh, we will be talking about walking in due course, and uh, you will learn then why I'm sitting. Uh, and the other is that I am not biologist, and my knowledge of biology is extremely restricted, and that was a serious problem when I was still able to walk decently, and we were spending all sorts of vacations together with my grandsons, and they were asking some questions about the plants or something, and the only answer I was able to figure out for the, those questions was, keep straight, take out your hands out of your pockets, and something like this. I never was able to explain anything in biology, so this will be an experiment of uh, I'm learning some biology preparing this, uh, this lecture. I sent the, uh, something which was called syllabus before, and it is here, but uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I will be able to keep up with all the topics here and in the order which I had written. Uh, I actually prepared that syllabus a long time ago, and then I had a certain problem which postponed those lectures. So anyway, there is a, we will be basically talking about uh, physics as a, applied to the uh, biological sciences and to medicine. Uh, so do not expect a very serious mathematics. Uh, I believe that there is only one real mathematical equation which will appear on this lecture, and only in order to show you that I am capable of writing such a complicated equation, but we will not be able, we will not be using this equation, but just to show you that, that you can write a complicated equation describing an extremely complicated physical problem that is how you are standing and what is happening to your body when you are simply standing still. All right, so this is a syllabus, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and there's a lecture number one. Uh, until basically mid of the 19th century, people were not completely sure whether a living nature can actually be described by the same laws of physics as the inanimate object. And uh, there was a good reason for it. There were hardly any experiments which were able to answer to the very simple questions. So the fundamental question was, are living structures subject to the same laws of physics. And that picture which you can see is a famous picture which solved at least one problem. Until the mid of the 19th century, experts were quarreling about whether galloping horse can be in a one stage of a galop airborne. Whether the horse, when it's running very fast, is always keeping at least one of its legs on the, fr on, the, on the ground or not. And finally, this was resolved, and this is the first ever picture taken on which you can see that the horse is airborne. The picture was taken in the mid of the 19th century by this fellow, my bridge, and it's now one of the very expensive items in the gallery in London. Uh, the, the other issue was, so the, the question whether a motion and the macroscopic behavior of animals and plants can actually be described by the same laws of physics as a motion of a falling rock has been solved. There is no doubt that the living objects can be described by the same laws of physics than the 
than the inanimate object. However, there is still a problem that the living structure of the world around us is enormously complicated. Even a simple cell consists of something like a 10 to the power 14 of atoms. And that is a many-body problem, as the physicists will say. And although physics is an extremely powerful tool, and essentially everything what you are using in the everyday life is a product of our mastering of the physics problems, uh, then the, we are not able to tell how the living cell of, say, apple behaves the way it behaves, just starting from the detailed analysis of how many atoms there are and what kind of atoms are there, what, what kind of chemical molecules consist of what we call atoms. We are not able to, ex so there is still a lot of unexplained uh, rules, but we know that these are rules of physics. The, in the 19th century, people were thinking that there is something which they call a vital force, which is an unknown, a new law of nature, which governs the behavior of a living structure. Even there were doubts whether the organic molecules are actually synthesized in the same way than the molecules which people were synthesized in the laboratory. And the, this notion of a vital force, some unknown law of nature which governs the living object is in some sense existing until today. There is a street in Warsaw on which there is an incredible concentration of the spiritual healers, clairvoyants, and so forth. And I actually drove yesterday evening, preparing for today's lecture, through that street. And I was counting the labels of those gentlemen or, or ladies, I don't know. They mostly have the Chinese or Vietnamese names, so the, but the, there are lots of them. And they all claim that there is a vital force and that they can cure all, all sorts of possible diseases. It's a very interesting place. They offer also courses in prediction future with the glass sphere and something like this. I even once subscribed to those courses, but after the first course I was recognized and throw away. So I don't know how to predict the future with the, with the, with the glass ball, so to say. Um, but the fact that the organic molecules are also governed by the same laws of chemistry as the normal one was solved in the 19th century by this fellow Frederick Weller, who in 1800 28, he synthesized urea, which is a biological molecule. And later on, the, essentially everything was synthesized in the laboratory. So we know that the physics is capable of describing the phenomena in the living nature. And what I will be trying to show you, not, I, I'm not going to teach you a physics. I understand that most of you have finished high school, so you have heard that there is such a thing as physics, and you might remember that there is a something which is called the slide, or you may even may have seen a pendulum or something like this. So I understand that you have a basic physics, and we will be mostly talking about the application, but I will be just refreshing your memory about the some facts of physics, if that will be necessary. So we are going to talk about the physics of a living structure. And there are two features which are very peculiar for uh, living structures. It is that there is a tremendous complexity of those structures. We have enormous amount of 
objects which we call living structures. And the other is that there is a tremendous variability of a grow mode. Also, even within uh, the same species, uh, well, biological species, for example, apes. If you look at apes, they come out with so many different sizes. And the question which is, is, is actually very fundamental is why that happened? Why not the animals, for example, are of, of a given species, are all of the same size? Why we, humans, are not all of the same size? And is there any order in the fact how the animals, plants grow? Are there any universal rules which tell us is the evolution actually governed by some kind of a fundamental law which tell us why if you look, if we go to zoo and look at different kinds of animals of the same species, we can immediately tell that this is ape in spite of the fact that there are these very tiny little apes and there are these huge apes which you can see in the in remote places in Africa or on the movies. So I will be first talk about the variability of this grow mode. And uh, I start with a, with a very simple problem. And as you will see in the due of my course, that we will be continuously coming back to this introductory a part which will be today lecture. Well, this is an animal which is called dog. And let's see how the dog looks like if we make it four times bigger. Well, four times bigger <coughs> dog is like this. But if you have ever seen a big dog and a small dog, you know that the big dogs are not just multiplied by a factor small dogs. Animals do not grow with the, with the normal scale. So what happens? How that... Is there any law about it? And there is a law about it. And it's one of the very fundamental laws of nature, which is hardly ever mentioned in the curricula in the high schools. And even when I was at university, I never heard about that law. And uh, it is, uh, it's very crucial to, to, to know that it exists. And we, until today, we do not know how that really has come about. And the first individuals who used that name was Julian Huxley in 1936, who was studying the, one of the Pacific crops. And he realized that, independent, that there is a, some peculiar law, that the size of the body of the crop and the size of its clothes are actually proportional. And that the size of the clothes is a certain power of a size of the body. And this is a diagram which shows this dependence. And we call that law allometry. And uh, uh, and I will now take you for a while into the realm of uh, movies. I like movies so much. And I assume that most of you have seen a movie, King Kong. And there are two pictures of a King Kong here. There is a one from the first movie by Schoenberg and Cooper from 1933. This is this left picture. And on the right, there is a King Kong from a very recent movie. It's a giant, enormous ape. So everybody can do the experimental science a bit. And I did it. I just simply watched the movie on the television set. And I pressed the button. I got the stop 
frame and I took the ruler and measured the height of the King Kong and you can out of that immediately find out what is the size of the King Kong and it is a size about 20 times a size of a real gorilla. So the question is, can that ha possibly happen? Can a living animal grow to that size? Okay, that's one problem. The other is what I call a Godzilla case. There are movies about Godzilla. This is a kind of a dinosaur. And as we know, it is of the size of the Empire State Building. The largest dinosaur ever found on the Earth is that one on the picture below, and it only had about, the, its length was about the 30 meters, and the height was about the 13 meters. So it's far cry to this Empire State Building. So can the structure, a living structure like Godzilla ever exist? So these were the questions I, I asked. And now I will provide you a certain argument which allows you to answer that kind of a question. And that argument comes from the work of Galileo Galilei. And I will use it for inanimate work. And when we will be talking about the elasticity of uh, skeletons, of the humans or animals, we will be using essentially the same arguments to prove that if the King Kong, who was a size 20 times gorilla, its bones had to be made out of reinforced concrete. And that is rather impossible because he will be collapsing under his own weight. So the Galileo arguments I will present to you is related to the not living structure which is Mount Everest. We know that Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world. It has, what, about eight kilometers. So let's ask the question, how high could be a mountain on the Earth? And the, the argument is very simple if one uses a, a simple geometry. The Mount Everest is basically a cone made of a granite and it's also a rather flat cone and actually is very similar to what is called the Kepler cone and the Kepler cone is the cone which is formed by rotating the Kepler triangle and the Kepler triangle is the triangle which is, a, is rectangular and has the length of the uh, its size which are given on the picture. And I use the label phi because this is a golden mean. This is a triangle which if you apply the Pythagoras theorem to it, that is the a square plus b square is equal c square, then uh, you will find out that the phi is the, is the golden mean which is one half of the one plus square root of five. So having this triangle, I can calculate the volume of that mountain. And the weight is a density times volume. So I can calculate the weight of, the, of that structure. And as you might remember, a pressure is a force divided by the surface so I can calculate what is the pressure exerted by this kind of mountain on the floor. And that pressure, that pressure is linearly proportional to the density, and it is a constant factor, which is square root of golden mean divided by 3. So then I use the Wikipedia, and the Mount Everest is made of the granite, and the density of a granite is about the three tons per square meter, uh, per cubic meter. So I also can find that the granite flows becomes a liquid when applied to it a force which is about the 10 to the power 8 of a kilograms per square meter. 
So that is now the very simple calculation to find out that the maximum height of a mountain made out of granite on the Earth is a 33 kilometers. There cannot be any higher mountain. And of course, the Mount Everest is not at 33 meters. It's only 8 kilometers. And the reason is that we have mount that there is a air on the, our planet. And there is a something which is called erosion. And also because the Mount Everest is not a solid piece of granite, it has voids and also, also possible structures. But this is the argument. The laws of physics as applied to the structure can tell us that it cannot be too large. So maybe there is a, some kind of a relation between the laws which tell us how big living structures can also be. And there are now real experimental data. The data are, which I have picked up to show for you are about birds. As you know, the birds comes out in a tremendous variety of sizes. There are these little colibri birds, which are very little, about the five centimeters of the size. And there are huge birds, which are ostriches. And biologists have, they have done the enormous work they have uh, measured the sizes of a, and weights of a bird eggs. Eight hundred of species, from colibri to the ostriches. And if we measure the weight in the one thousands of kilograms, then it turns out that there is a universal relation between the mass of the egg and the mass of the body of the bird. And it has a universal exponent, three-fourth. It is completely unexpected. The, but that seems to that holds. It's about threefold. Uh, you may, you are a biologist, at least by name, so you know that there is something which is called the metabolic rate, how, how fast the energy is being consumed by our, by living structure. And that seems to be the relation between the egg and the body which has something to do with the metabolic rate. And there is all over the sudden this coefficient three-fold. It has nothing to do with the relation surface of the egg to the mass of the egg, which will be two-thirds. So it's unexpected from where this exponent three-fold has come. In 1895, certain gentleman by the name Oscar Snell study the relation between the weight of a human brain and the human body. And he studied that relation, and he found out that the relation is also given by a power law. And it also come out with the same exponent, exponent 3, 4. So, uh, of course, there are, there are discrepancies with the, of a given brain and given person. We know that the smallest brain ever studied by the, how you call people who are studying the, 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 the brains removed from the, from the, from the dead bodies, well, never mind. Uh, the, the smallest brain was a brain of a very famous French writer, Anatole Fran France. And the largest brain apparently belonged to the Oliver Cromwell. So there are differences. But this is the experimental relation, three-fourth. And you see on this diagram very many different animals. The red arrow points to humans, so we are not really on the line. 
the best animals which fits the Treeford law are donkeys and goats and cats and uh, mountain beavers and cows. But basically the law holds. Treeford. Uh, and uh, in 1997, a group of the distinguished biophysicists had published a paper. This is the, in, it was published in Science, that this relation is universal. That if there are any quantities which are pertinent to description of the living animal, which are related to the metabolic rate, then this is described by the relation which I had written here. And this is the allometry law. And the exponent is three-fourth. And below I had written an equation that remarkably this exponent can be described by the, by the one other number, which is the dimensionality of the world we are living. It's the dimension of our world divided by four. And that, uh, how they come out with it, and that, that can be derived, and we will derive that law in our course, when we will be talking about the fluid dynamics. Because it's a beautiful example how elementary reasoning can lead to the very fundamental law. And the, uh, there are three assumptions which are necessary to prove that relate that exponent reform. One, that the network supplying the entire volume of an organism with whatever resources, like a blood or nutrition, uh, must be space filling and behaves like a fractal. The fractal is the mathematical word to describe the objects which are difficult to describe in the other ways. And the smallest element, the final element of this branching, must be size invariant, must be the same for all the animals. And the third, which is the uh, laws of conservation of energy, is that energy required to distribute the resources must be minimized. And it is remarkable that out of these three very general principles, we can derive this exponent threefold. But of course, it only refers to a very peculiar type of quantities which are related to this metabolic rate. But the other parameters describing living structures are also described by the, by the, by the allometric law. This is, a, this is a picture which shows you this fractal-like feeling. Our blood system is like this. We have main veins, which then, and aortas, which split into smaller ones, smaller and smaller, and eventually they end up in the capillaries, and all the capillaries are identical. The, so they are scale, size invariant at the end. And that is a picture which I will use in the, to derive that law in the final, in, in, at the center time in our meeting. But there are other laws. For example, rodents. Rodents. They, 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 they can eat nuts. Then they break nuts. And there is a relation, an experimental relation between the, between the size of the rodent and the force of the jaw of the rodent which this animal can apply to break, to, in order to break the nuts. And that is a different exponent, but it's also universal for I don't know how many. And there are many, many other 
uh, example, is humans are also described by lots of allometry laws. For example, our hands, length of our arms, is also related by allometric law to our size. And that, that is the reason why the hands of the children are different size, so to say, relative to the body than the size of the growth of humans. All right. So we have this allometric law. And this is an example of an extremely general law which seems to be very important for the living world, so to say, which is related to the basic laws of physics. And uh, we will be returning to it uh, occasionally in our further meetings. So now we are coming to the number two lecture, which is a classical mechanic of a living structure. There is the same picture of the running course. And before I will start, I will try to refresh your memory of a basic notions of a mechanics. A body, when it's moving, is described by its position in the three-dimensional world we are living. And that position changes in time. And how fast it is changing in time, uh, it's called velocity. So if we throw a stone, or rock, or arrow, a bottle of Coke, or some other liquid, it moves over a trajectory in three-dimensional space. And the velocity is always tangent to that trajectory. So that's velocity. And velocity is a vector. It has three components in a three-dimensional world, because I can move left, right, and up and down. And uh, for those of you who know a little bit of Bohr mathematics, the velocity and position are related by a simple derivative, the first order derivative. Uh, next derivative is an acceleration. Acceleration is how fast the velocity is changing in time. And the second law of Newton, we have three laws of Newton. The, the second law tells us that the acceleration of a body is proportional to the force which is applied to that body. And that coefficient is a mass of the body. And the force, when it's applied to the area, it is given a pressure. It's called pressure. This is the definition of a mass. And here it's a very important notion, which is a moment of force. You remember that if I, if I want to lift a stone, I can put a piece of wood underneath it and press on one side. And even if I have a long piece of wood, then with a small force, I can raise a big stone. Uh, Archimedes used to say that if he had a point of support, he would be able to move the earth. So this is actually how what is called the moment of force. And it is mathematically what is called the vector product. But it is a product of a length of an arm times force and some function describing how they are orientated with respect to each other. So that was as much of the physics as we need. And there is also work. Work in physics is basically a force and a multiplied by a distance. If you want to push a cupboard in your flat, 
that you will do a lot of work if you have to push it through all the room and only very little work if you had to push it at two centimeters. So it's very it's a very natural notion of the work. It's a force and a distance over which we have to move a given option. Okay, if I have a body, the body has a support. And the stability, when I'm, is defined by what happens to the weight of a body with respect to its support. And I, had the, I, I made this drawing to show that if the weight, which is always on the earth, in the direction downwards, because the gravity points toward the center of the earth, if it's within the support, then the body is stable, it will not fall. But if the weight points outside of the body support, then the body will fail. So the stability, for example, by a human body, is very simple. If I am standing, then the center, my center of gravity uh, is right below my belly, and the, my weight factor, direction of the weight, is between my legs, and therefore I am standing stable. I am not standing stable, so I am sitting, but that is basically what should happen. So let's now solve a very simple problem of a stability. Let's push that person to the left with a force which I called F. So when I push that person and the person doesn't bend, then I apply a torque with respect to the feet of that individual. Assuming that the height of the body from the shoulder to the feet is about the one meter five, and the weight is about the 70 kilograms, then I can calculate that pivoting torque is equal about the one half, is given by the formula, and the restoring torque is equal to the product of the weight times the length of the limb of the length. So that is a simple calculation to be done. When the person weighs 70 kilograms, the weight is 6 ah, newtons. In the physics, we measure forces in units which are called newtons. Newton is a force which accelerates one kilogram giving the, for a one meter second square. And we measure work with joules. Newton, you know, who was. Joule was a man who was a very good producer of a beer in Liverpool. And uh, he was, is a father of uh, thermodynamics. So we call the units of a work joule. And joule is basically the work which you have to spend in order to raise an apple, average size apple, from the floor by one meter. That's the good definition of a joule which does not require any knowledge of mathematics. So the force, the weight is about the 700 newtons. So I can easily calculate the torque. The torque is in newtons times meters. And I can calculate the condition of stability in order not to fall the torque to apply to my head must be the same as to my feet and therefore they have to be equal and if they are equal then I can calculate the force and the force with which I have to push I can push the person 
and that person will not fall is even 45 newtons. So it's very small force. It's really small force. So what, the, what, what, ha, what, what should you do if somebody pushes you with the largest force? You have to bend. All right. So now I have to ex introduce you a certain complicated concept. It's called lever. Lever is a piece of wood or whatever with a given length, which is supported. And the support is that red triangle. And the support of a lever is called fulcrum. And we have three kinds of levers. It's a lever of a kind one. This is this one, which I have now drawn. I have the piece of wood. I have a support. And on the one end, I s there is a load. And on the other, there is applied force. And this is a lever number one, type one. This is what is called the lever number two. The fulcrum is on the one end. The load is in the middle, roughly. And the applied force is on the other end. And the third kind of lever is the fulcrum is still on the one end. The load is on the other end, and the force is somewhere in between. And it turns out that in the, all the bones in our body works with the, as a lever number three. And now I would like to show you a very simple problem. Uh, Uh, that there's a, there is a very trivial calculation that if this thing is stable, then the force applied must be equal to the weight times a, a fraction, which is a, which comes from dividing these two lengths, dl over df. dl is the length between the fulcrum and the load, and df is the length between the fulcrum and the applied force. So if you have this, you can calculate the quantity with engineers called a mechanical advantage. This is the ratio of a weight to the force. And for most of the levers three, it's, I mean, it, it can be either one or less than one or larger than one. And that is the quantity which tells us how good, in some sense, is the lever. And there is a very simple calculation, which I will omit in order not to bore you too much already today, is that if I have the lever and if I apply a force, then according to the second law of Newton, I, this point to which I apply the force will try to move. And it will be moved with a certain velocity. And the same to the point where the load is hanging. It also moves with a certain velocity. And it turns out that the velocity with which these two points move, the ratio of those velocities, is essentially inverse of the mechanical advantage. And that is a law. The simple, trivial law of, me of mechanics, which the living structure use to, to cons for uh, constructing our response to variety of, uh, of things. Namely, we will see this in a moment, that the lever in our hands is a lever number three, and it has a mechanical advantage less than one. So it, in order to lift a small weight, we have to apply a tremendous force to our muscles. But this is very non-economical. But because of this relation with the velocities, we find out that we can move it very fast. 
If you know who is pitcher in the baseball, have you ever seen the game of baseball? I mean, this fellow who throws the ball is called pitcher. The pitcher takes the ball and throws it with his hand, and he can throw the ball with a speed which is almost 150 kilometers per hour. So he can move with his hands extremely fast. And that is because he has to use enorm enormous force. And I believe that is why the pitchers suffer uh, uh, very often the separated shoulder because they, they simply throw it too fast. All right. So this will be the end of today's talk. We talk about the skeletal muscles. Most animals have muscles and bones. And the muscles attach to the bones. They attach to the bones by tendons. And uh, there is a law which was also known to Leonardo da Vinci already, that no muscles attach to the same bone. The muscles connect always two bones. And there is a pivotal point of these two bones, of these two bones which are connected to each other, and that is a drawing of our hand. And in our hand, we have several muscles. If they have two ends, they are called biceps. If they have three ends, they are called tri triceps, if I correctly pronounce it. And that is basically the structure of our hand. So I will now, and the, and the muscles have a certain uh, cross section. And the maximum force a muscle can exert is proportion to this cross-section of the muscle. This is because the muscles consist of a little wires, so to say. They have, of course, the biological name. And each of them can exert a certain force. And the cross-section is just a measure of how many of these little micro muscles are there in a final construction. So that is the important thing. And this uh, experimentally, it is established that the, uh, that the maximum force the our muscles can exert is about the 70 newtons per centimeter square. All right, so the solving the problem. The problem is we have to lift a weight. We take a weight and we try to lift it. What are the forces related to this? And suppose that the angle is about the, I keep my hand at the, about the 100 degrees and the weight is certain. I don't know how much I put there so I can describe the situation using my levers. That is why I introduce levers. Uh, our hand is a lever, and it's a lever number three. So now I have to calculate these forces. And that seems to be complicated, but basically it's very simple. Uh, first is that I have to calculate the angle between the force of my muscle and the arm. And that can be done without any physics by a simple geometry. So I can calculate this angle theta by simple trigonometry. And I will not do this. There is a something which is called the sine theorem, which allows you to do these calculations. Children do it in the, when I was in the high school. We, I did it in the second grade. Now it is on the, uh, your colleagues who are on the PhD school of mathematics, they are, so they are learning the sign theorem because it's, uh, we are now not teaching any sensible mathematics in the school. All right, so we have this angle and I calculated the angle is 72 degrees 
and now I will solve the problem. Again, the equilibrium conditions are for the forces. The forces have to be equal, so that this is a one equation, and this, there is a set of equations, two equations, and if you count correctly, there are three unknowns. So you cannot solve it. So you have to figure out another equation. And the other equation is that the torque on the fulcrum must be always zero. So I can calculate that. And I can do this very simple calculation. And assuming that the biceps is of a diameter 8 centimeter, and as I said, the muscle can withstand 70 newtons per centimeter square, a maximum force the arm, human arm can support is at 334 newtons. So the force applied to the fulcrum is very huge. It's more than almost one, one and a half thousand newtons. And that is something tremendously uneconomical. To lift uh, a, a 14 kilogram weight, I have to apply enormous force. And our body is built to do so. But remember, the velocity with which I have to move is inversely proportional to the mechanical advantage of this particular lever. So therefore, I can move my hand very fast. And not only the pitchers can do this, the boxers can do the same. The people who are, I mean, the, the karate fighters and so forth, they can use it very fast. So, all right, so I solved that problem. I think you are tired by this, and we will start next time by discussing a hip. And I would like only to show you a drawing. This is a human hip, and the question is, what is the force which is acting on your hip? I'm very keen of solving this problem because I had underwent a surgery on both of my hips. So I was always asking, and uh, when, when, when I went to the hospital for the first time, uh, I was very, I, I didn't know this calculation. And I asked one, in the morning, you know, in the hospital, it's always somebody is coming to check whether you are still alive. So there was a, a, a young doctor who came to see whether I'm still alive. And I asked him, well, could you kindly tell me what is the typical force which is acting on my hip? And he looked at me and said, oh, that must be few newtons. Uh -huh. That's OK. Yeah. Then in the, afternoon, in the evening, there was a lady doctor who came and to check whether I'm still alive. And I asked her, could you kindly tell me what is a typical force which is acting on my hip? And she said, oh, well, hundreds of newtons. And then I realized that they have no focus idea what are those forces. And uh, uh, it took me a while. And when I was preparing this lecture, I found out why not to calculate this force finally and to learn what it is. And we will do it next time. This is a hip. And there is this little red uh, piece on the drawing. And these are muscles which do all the work. So the, what are the forces acting in this the bearing are impossible, are very fine. The important thing is that they must have, the people who had invented endoprothetic, the replacement of the hip, they must also have known this, this calculation. For they figure out that it is extremely simple. Uh, construction, the, the real construction by, by nature is extremely complicated as compared to what, the, what, what, what is now in my body. And uh, apparently it works much better. Uh, and uh, the guarantee for it is now 70 years. So it's much longer than the guarantee for a nature one. So that is, uh, uh, that we will do this, this calculation uh, next time, and we will then move to the dynamics of walking.
Thanks.